I do read the comments that accompany my YouTube programs, and I'm happy to report that most are complimentary. However, occasionally subscribers and members state that they do not hear enough from me about composition. So I hope that this program will go some way to putting that matter right. When it comes to composition, I find it one of the most difficult things to teach. We talk about having the picture in thirds. This is something I am not conscious of when I actually take the picture. Maybe it's something in the back of my mind because sometimes when people look at my pictures, they say that my pictures fall naturally in two thirds. Be that as it may, there are one or two other pointers I can bring to your attention regarding composition. So, let's get going. This shot of Arundel Castle is a classic example of traditional composition. The river, the River Arun, leads the eye towards the castle. You have a bush or something like that on the left-hand side and rising ground to the right, which helps to keep the eye into the picture, the castle, of course, being the focal point. What we are trying to do is to create the third dimension to a two-dimensional image and to have something strong in the foreground, as with this next picture, where we have a track leading the eye way into the distance. That helps to give the picture depth, though it might have helped to have something a bit more interesting at the end of the track. Foreground interest can be as simple as a few rocks plonked into the foreground to give the image the third dimension. Up here on Winda, I've used the Ordnance Survey trick point and can to give an impression of the summit with the view far behind. You really feel that you can walk into the picture. Now, if you feel I haven't included enough of the view, well, that was done on the ascent, as we see in this particular example. This footpath at Chilworth was a godsend for creating the third dimension. And also, it shows how a diagonal strengthens the image. And incidentally, I keep your eye in the picture by including that bush on the right-hand side. The emphasis on a diagonal is again seen in the next picture, local to me, enhanced, of course, by the autumn tints. But I do feel that it is the diagonal of the path that strengthens this particular image. Foreground interest doesn't have to be something in the centre or a diagonal going across the picture. It can be at Swiss Garden, a building, a shelter, which I have occupied the left-hand side of the picture, allowing you to see the garden on the right. And of course, the inclusion of that building gives the photograph depth, as does the next picture of Birkenhead Priory, where we see the ruin, or part of the ruin, on the left-hand side, and the main part of the intact church in the distance. The ruin on the left-hand side adds depth to the image. Creating the third dimension can also be achieved by framing the image, like here at Chichester Cathedral, where in fact I was trespassing a little bit by standing in the deanery grounds. It can be a little more subtle at Godston. The main building in the centre is framed by buildings left and right, and we have the addition of the wall in the foreground, which gives the picture depth. And a similar situation at Westrum, with the war memorial on the left and the gravestones on the right, but this time the footpath leads the eye down into the picture and the focal point. Depth to an image can be created with the help of the garden designer, particularly those of formal gardens at Rygate Priory. And in architecture 
2. The recent restoration of King's Cross Station, London, makes a wonderful example of symmetry. This particular shot, incidentally, is taken from the overbridge to the platforms, which you can only access when you are going to your train. But it's worth a stop. Furthermore, Inside our great cathedrals, the master craftsman had an eye for depth and symmetry at Lincoln and a little later in Croydon at St. Michael and All Angels Church. Taking symmetry to its limit, this might be regarded as a little too risky, but I am on a public footpath that crosses the railway track, but I better move out of the way quickly. A view does not necessarily need foreground interest, like this shot of Scout Scar in Cumbria, which is not far from Kenlaw. First of all, that trek helps to lead the eye in the right direction, and with the help of evening lighting, then the contours of the landscape lead our eye to the distant hills, the focal point being the Langdale Pikes. They are the twin peaks, the pointed peaks in the distance. If it's not the landscape itself, it is something more natural like that cloud. It really does lead the eye towards Liverpool Anglican Cathedral. With this next shot taken near Bosom, I was fascinated by the dead tree, and wasn't it handy that a dark cloud was in the background, and yes, I did get wet shortly afterwards. And thirdly, at sunset at Hastings, with the low level of light caused by the setting sun, it is the patterns in the foreground that helps again to lead the eye into the photograph. Shooting into the light at Bossom Key can help the composition. The glistening water helps to lead the eye straight into the uh, picture. But with the last picture at Paddington Basin in uh, London, I really turned things on its head. I was fascinated by this iron bridge and the patterns in it, so I make it half the photograph, and I think it helps, actually. And incidentally, that person, that chap there, walked into the picture, so I decided to include him. It provides the focal point and also gives scale to the image. Well, that's it for the moment. I've only touched the surface of composition. There is so much I could talk about. So I will probably, when I think of something, make this a series. So that's it for now. Hope you've enjoyed it. See you next time.